Hello, this is another episode of In Conservation with my name is David Lindo. I'm also known as the Urban Birder. And um, today I have a guest who I guess goes back a way back in my history as well. He kind of saw me grow from a sapling to a slightly bigger sapling, um, Stephen Moss. Um, this is In Conservation Wave. If you're watching this in the future online, on YouTube, on the Urban Bird World channel, please tell your friends, please like and subscribe and all that sort of stuff. The more people that know about this wealth of information, the better. And today, today, should I say, it's going to be no exception. You're going to be learning a lot tonight about owls. So Stephen Moss, my dear friend from a long time ago, how are you and where are you? I'm pretty well, thanks, David. I'm I'm in Somerset in my little garden office, which makes me look like something out of a Dracula movie. The lighting is not not brilliant. Um, I won't be being distracted by birds unless the owls hoot. We have tawny and little owls here. Uh, so you never know. The other night I was here and a male tawny was hooting outside. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm in a bit of a, a change point in life i'm i'm leaving my job at bath spa i've been teaching there for eight years now i'll still be doing a bit of teaching but i'm leaving my staff job um really to avoid the sheer horror of the bureaucracy of working for a british university which some of your guests might know um so yeah i've got got a big 2024 and that I'll, I'll be free to do other things which will be good I'm glad for you actually because I think you know watching you over the years you work phenomenally hard phenomenally hard and it's obviously had an impact on your health as well um not only are you working phenomenally hard in you know university work and previously in tv and what have you but the fact that you write a book every two minutes is something that you know I find amazing so for those who haven't heard of Stephen Moss um after this afternoon, after this session now, I suggest you buy a bookcase and go and get his books. I mean, you will need a bookcase for his books. He's probably written two since we've been speaking. Oh, Rob Lambert once said that he read my books on the air, on the plane, the flight to Australia. I said, blimey, Rob, they don't take that long to write, which is slight exaggeration, but, um, but yeah. So Some for of those who... You are, you know, you you well, you're kind of a semi regular on in conservation with. You've been on. This is your third appearance on in conservation with, and I must say the lighting gets better each time. This isn't, you know, this is much better than uh, it's a vast improvement than the last time you were here. Um, can you just quickly break down who you are? Because, you know, I guess people watching this, um, you know, on YouTube would not necessarily know who you are. I mean, obviously, you are one of Britain's leading nature writers and broadcasters, and you're obviously based in Somerset, born in London, um, and you have an enormous um, list of credits when it comes to TV work, including working on Spring Watch. And as far as I'm concerned, you're the man that introduced Bill Oddie to the world in terms of uh, the birding and natural history world, so that's an accolade in itself. Yeah, that's the thing I'm probably most proud of actually i actually had lunch with bill last week i was up in london i hadn't seen him for a few months so i popped over and he's pretty well you know it's lovely to see him i i have very you know we did become genuinely close friends and we also had some of the biggest arguments i've ever had with anyone working with, with each other uh mainly because i'm an optimist and he's a pessimist but um yeah so i worked in telly but i gave that up people still introduced me as a tv producer and i gave it up nearly 10 years ago now i left the bbc 2011 worked there nearly 30 years i did a few independent productions and then i stopped doing that and started teaching which is a very different approach and as you say i, I write a lot of books really because i've got very expensive and demanding children who seem to just leech money out of me so please buy they're quite big children now, though, aren't they? I mean, I'm sure they are. Yeah, the, the younger thing. ones are nearly nineteen, George and Daisy, and Charlie's twenty, and the other ones are <clears throat> in their thirties. Um, so, like you, I have older children and a grandson now. I haven't got quite as many grandchildren as you, but, but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, life is pretty good, and I, you know, I love writing. I love teaching people. Um, I wouldn't say teaching people to write. Someone said you can't teach creative writing; you can only teach creative writers. And I think that is probably true. But That's an interesting, interesting point, actually, because, you know, 
you have to have some kind of seed there, really. You can't just be taught to be creative. I think you either are or not, surely. Yeah, you have to have something to write about. And of course, a lot of our students are quite mature. I mean, we have every year, I, I, when I've been interviewing, always get someone who says, oh, I'm 45, I'm far too old to come on your course. And I said, well, the oldest person on that course um, graduated at the age of 88, so you're probably okay. Um, you know, a lot of the students are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s. And they've obviously got something to write about. And even the younger, some of the younger ones are incredibly talented. But I do think I started writing in my sort of early 30s. I do think you have to have a bit of perspective on life. But that's not to say that young people can't write fantastic books. Is there, I mean, is there infinite, infinite uh, amounts of stuff to write about in the natural world, <laughs> you think? That's a very good question. I taught on an MA called Nature and Travel Writing. And when I was growing up, travel writing, if you, if you, if you said to people, what do you read that isn't a reference book or, or fiction, um, it would be travel writing. You know, what we would now call creative nonfiction, i.e. a story. And they were people like Jan Morris and Bruce Chatwin and, and you know, uh, Eric Newby and a whole uh, Paul Theroux who's, of course, now only famous for being Louis Threw's dad, but used to be very famous. Um, and travel writing sort of disappeared up its own ass, really, by by sort of becoming a bit too pretentious and a bit too all about the writer. And I think there's a bit of a danger of nature writing doing that. Um, having said that, I just recommended my books of the year for Mark Avery's website. Have a look at it uh, for his blog. And I'm a guest writer for it every year I do roundup of as many natural history books as I can find. And the three I chose as my favourite books of the year were all at least part memoirs. They had a lot more to them than that. So I think memoirs and nature writing do go together, but there's always a little bit of a danger that people will write mostly about themselves and not about nature. Yeah. It's interesting because my first book was a, a memoir, essentially, wasn't it? Yeah, it's very good. I, I, in fact, I edited it for you and wrote the forward. I remember. Exactly. Yeah, but but you know, I think I think it's good to write memoirs, and I bring memoir into my books in that I bring encounters with the birds that I've had, often from childhood, not always, but often from quite a long time ago, because they're the ones you remember, aren't they? You know, um, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. But I also think that we should be writing about nature, both environmentally, but also just for the joy of experiencing it. And I think actually bringing yourself into it makes it more accessible, no? Yes. I, I, what I say is, Mike Dilger, our mutual friend, always says that TV presenters, if you met them at a cocktail party, they'd say, that's enough about me, David. What do you think of me? Whereas uh, there's a lot of ego there. Not always, but often. Radio presenters are very different. Radio presenters, you can't see what they're seeing, so they have to guide you through it. And I think that's what nature writers do. I think as all writers, actually all writers, you know, travel writers, nature writers, you are writing about people, places, and in our case, wildlife, that other people either cannot see or maybe will never see. And you have to describe it and you have to say how you feel about it. And I, I completely agree. And I think that's that's very different. That doesn't feel egotistical to me. That feels like you are the guide, you know. And if you listen to good radio programmes on anything, that's what radio presenters do. Yeah. Um, well, we're kind of talking today about owls um, and because your, your latest book. Lovely cover. You have to put it right in front of your face, though, so we can't, so can't see. You can only see the picture of the owl. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's part of your um, your biographies, I suppose, your series of biographies. The previous ones included Robin, Wren, Swallows and Swan, um, all of them seemingly very successful. So I wish you the same with the with owl. Um, I guess it's not quite a biography, though, is it? Because owl implies one owl but you've talked about all the UK owls haven't you that's right yeah I, I want to each book I want to make different so the robin and the the robin and the wren obviously dealt with single species through the year 
monthly. Then the swallow was about a migrant, so a very different kind of bird, and I did it seasonally. Went back to the swan, but the swan's so different from all the others. So with the owl, yeah, I I, I thought quite hard about whether to do just barn owl, uh, which I think came second in your lovely survey, didn't it? Um, yeah, and is a very popular question. bird. But actually, in the end, I thought in terms of material, these birds who are subjects of these biographies, they have to have two things. They have to have really interesting behaviour. They have to have, you know, good, strong science that is different, unusual. And they have to also have, and these two are very closely related, they have to have a lot of cultural and social history around them. They have to be in myths or legends or literature or music or whatever. And a lot of birds don't have that. Blue tits, lovely bird, not particularly unusual behavior in that most tits behave roughly the same and as far as i know there is no great literature about blue tits compare that say with skylark or nightingale and you can see that there's a lot of unusual behavior and really interesting cultural references yeah. so yeah that's what i tried to do with owls so it is yes it's it i did say to the publishers why don't we call it the owls or owls of biography and they said no we want it to look the same so it's fine <laughs> okay so, well, you know what, let's, I mean, I, I'd be quite interested to chat about the owls individually if we just sort of talk about yeah, yeah. it. Um, I found out a few years ago that there's a place in Essex, I think there's an island, where it's possible to see all five of Britain's owls. Yeah, I think, the problem it, was the, was, I think it was an XREF site. Yeah, the problem was, they said to me, I'd have to go and stay on the island. Uh, and, <laughs> and there's a, one property on the island and it's haunted. <laughs> so, you know what? Um, I think I'll take my chances elsewhere. We well, see the reason it's haunted is that owls are very linked with ghosts. Because as Bill once said to me, as we were, I think we were filming a barn owl coming out, waiting for it to come out of some creepy tower in a castle in Scotland. And he said, well, you can imagine, can't you, that you hear this incredible screeching sound and then this white figure emerges and floats away. Of course, people thought it was a ghost, you know. Um, so, yeah. I think owls have great mythology, though a lot of mythology. Yeah. Well, let's let's actually start with the barn owl because it's I, I guess it's well apart from maybe the tawny owl behind me, it's the owl that I guess most people would conjure up in their in their minds when you speak of owls. What I find interesting, I mean, it's plenty of interesting things about the barn owl. I'm sure you're going to tell us about now. But in the US, um, well, the barn owl's distribution is practically worldwide, isn't it? In the US, I think they've recently split. The barn owl. Um, so I think it's called the American barn owl now. Um, but the interesting thing about it is the call that this bird has is much more screaming and freaky than um, the ones in England. I wonder if I can see if I can play this. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's similar, isn't it? Well. It's more Oh, that's scary. I mean, you're right. Owl, the barn owl used to be the world's most cosmopolitan bird in that it's found in all six uh, continents apart from Antarctica. But they've now split them three ways. I write about this in the book. So I've seen the one in Trinidad I saw, and I've seen them in the States as well, is now the American barn owl. And then the eastern barn owl I saw in Australia a few years ago. I, I'm never sure about this. I mean, they look like barn owls to me. <laughs> Like some, some are more tanned than others. I remember seeing one in Peru. It's like it's been out in the sun all day. It's really, yeah. really dark underneath his, um, on his undercarriage. Well, the ones in Europe are, aren't they? We occasionally get them in, in the Eastern Britain in winter. You get a very dark-breasted barn owl. I think it's a different race. Um, so, yeah, barn owls are interesting because I think you're right. They're far less common than tawny owls, but I think people see them more. To my shame, though, um, when I was a child, I didn't always keep notes about the birds I saw, but I thought I'd seen barn owl. But my first barn owl that I've now got on my Bubo World list, I was about 30. And I was driving along in Yorkshire and this owl flew past and it was silhouetted, but I, see, I knew it was a barn owl. I used to go to Norfolk, you know, from my teens for years, never saw a barn owl there. And then probably 20 years ago, I started going back there. Every time I went, I saw a barn owl. So... Maybe I was just very unobservant when I was a child. Um, very unlucky. Yeah, very unlucky. But they are, you know, they're wonderful birds. Of course, you know, they have the thing 
that their population varies. I, I wrote in the book about um, Bill's great line in Spring Watch, where the baby bar now ate its younger sibling in front of the live camera, and Bill, Bill said, big brother eats little brother. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, um, so yeah, you know, they have interesting habits. They they are often mistaken for ghosts. Um, there's a great video you can see online of two aliens and they really do look like aliens they have a weird round head very white weird body and hollow eyes completely hollow eyes and it was in india it was filmed in india and it went viral aliens have landed in india and they were baby barn owls and someone had gone into their nest with a, a light and a, a video so it was black and white at night and they were scared and so they'd stood up and you know, Vision. tried to look big. Um, but God, they look like, you know, you see those classic 1950s alien films with the big weird head and hollow eyes. They look like that. I don't know why aliens would look like that, but they did. So, yeah, a lot of interesting things about barn owls. Uh, the fact they are so cosmopolitan. Also in America, they use them in California. They put up boxes because in the wine areas particularly the wine areas where they're organic so they're not using rodenticides to kill rats and mice they need the barn owls because otherwise you know they're going to have plagues of rats and mice so barn owls have really encouraged there it's interesting um about um encouraging barn owls to nest because i know in israel i remember a friend of mine was doing some survey survey work on barn owls and um apparently israel has the largest density of barn owls in the world um, so he tells me uh, there were nest boxes everywhere and they got really you know high sort of turnover population um and similarly when i go to serbia especially during the spring um it's quite a large number of barn owls to be seen but in extra maduro where i am in southwest spain i've only ever seen a barn owl once and that's by accident when i was looking for little owls around the back of a shopping center in the middle of a town it just flew over my head um so for me, I, I can understand the fact that you didn't see many growing up because they kind of they're there or they're not there. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, they certainly they have bounced back a bit, particularly in East Anglia, because of a lot of work to try to um, put up nest boxes and things. And, and, you know, so I think I think they're doing OK, but there's very few pairs in Britain. I mean, Tawny Owls are by far the commonest owl in Britain, 50,000 pairs, I think. It's way higher than Barn Owl um i can't remember the exact figure but but you know um so i think it's interesting that that obviously barn owls are crepuscular that lovely word isn't it seen at dawn and dusk so we tend to see them more often but where i live in somerset i haven't seen one for about three years but then i'll go out this winter and suddenly i'll probably see one every time i walk the dog for a winter you know so they're they're, they're so cyclical in terms of their populations that you know, if you've, if you've got them around, they're around. Then the following year, they're not. Yeah. And you, they are, to me, the archetypal bird of the countryside. Mm. But I've seen them in urban areas. I mean, there's been reports from my local patch in southwest, in West London, um, one with scrubs. Um, but I also know that they breed on the edges of London as well. I mean, you can go to places like Rain and Marshes on the east eastern edge of London, and they occur there. So they seem to be quite well so semi-resilient to uh to us humans yeah well they basically eat mice and voles don't they really they've got mice and voles they're happy so what they like you know when the barn owls for example you saw in australia do they behave like ours i mean are they uh okay. that people see every now and again or yeah, I saw them in Queensland. I just saw one. I think it was just floating past as barn owls do. And at the time it was like, oh, that's nice, barn owl. And then, of course, they decided it was a different species. But, you know, who knows? And of course, barn owls are kind of slightly different to the, the main owl tribe, aren't they? They're a separate family. Yeah, Titani Day. Um, so some of the grass owls, I think, are in that. And marsh owl, I think, is in that family as well. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I, I write at the beginning of the book, I write a chapter on, you know, what is an owl? Because it's a very fundamental question. You know, what makes owls different? Because there are other families like night sharks that, of course, are completely, more or less completely nocturnal. More so than owls, actually, because quite a few owls are quite diurnal. 
Um, and there's obviously a lot of other birds like night heron and nightingale, which predominantly are active at night or, or parts of the year are. Um, and I think owls, do, they do have some unique characteristics, which I looked into in, in the book. And I think those unique characteristics, particularly their mysteriousness and their nocturnal nature, means that they are very big in mythology. They're, they're probably the family. The raven's probably the bird that is most... Um, featured in mythology ancient mythologies but the owls as a collective group are definitely the biggest group in terms of a family and i think that's you know that's partly because they are mysterious it's partly because they look like humans they look forward their eyes face forward um and it's partly because you know if a bird is nocturnal it's going to attract a lot of stories around it some some of them quite dark yeah Okay, well, talking of dark, let's go back to, or let's move on to even the owl behind me with the dark eyes, the tawny owl, um, a bird that um, I've always associate with complete and utter secrecy. And it's quite interesting in, in urban areas they're like London, for example, they're probably far more common than people think. I mean, they, yeah. they even breed in the middle of parks like Hyde Park. Um, I remember a friend of mine who was completely uninterested in anything natural history uh, called me and saying, what's this weird screaming going outside my window? What is this? And she lived in, in West London and it was a tawny owl, in fact, two tawny owls duetting because, of course, to it to you know, people just think it's the one owl doing that. Um, I find tawny owls really interesting because they're very, uh, they seem to be very aggressive. Um, they seem to not tolerate other owls anywhere near them in terms of other species. Um, and of course, being a member of the Strix genus, um, they are the badasses really, aren't they? Because you've got the Ural owl, which is twice the size of an, an, a, a tawny owl, and it's like a tawny owl on steroids. But not to take away from the tawny owl, how aggressive it can be. Look at poor old Derek Hoskins. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I tell Eric's story in the book. It's an amazing story about how he lost his eye from a tawny owl. I mean, tawny owls are fascinating because they are incredibly common as you say they are very urban and rural we have them here in our garden they're incredibly sedentary they very rarely travel more than about a mile from where they're born and this something occurred to me. i moved down to somerset nearly 20 years ago now and about two or three years after i was here i was i had my office in my house at the time not in the garden and um till my wife threw me out and um the one morning at about 11 o'clock i was just about to go and get a cup of coffee and i heard and I thought, bloody Mike Dilger or David Linder, they've popped over and they're, <laughs> you know, playing a call outside. There. So I thought nothing of it. No one came to the door. So that's a bit weird. Next morning, I happened to get. Of course, it was a tawny owl, but I didn't realise at the time. And there was a paper a few years later in British Birds about this, that British tawny owls are incredibly sedentary compared to birds on the continent, probably because we have pretty mild winters. So they stay put in the same place. And that gives them a problem. In October, November, their, their brood of youngsters, particularly the males, want to establish a territory and they haven't moved. So it's a bit like my teenage kids. You can't kick them out. So the male hoots during the day. And apparently this doesn't happen anywhere else in the world where there are tawny owls. Um, so much so that it has been suggested they might be a separate species. Exactly. Race. Yeah. So, you know, really interesting stuff. Um, the other thing about tawny owls, you said how aggressive they are. They look cute, don't they? Owls always look cute. They look they look very human. A few years ago, um, I was on Spring Watch on in Minsmere and we were doing the red button and we had a nest of sparrowhawks. Sparrowhawks always look quite vicious, don't they? Anyway, they they laid the eggs hatched and they raised the young. And about a week later, after we left, I got a call from Nigel Bean, who's my friend who does the cameras on Spring Watch. And he said, oh, don't know if you've heard, but soon after we left, the sparrowhawk chicks were in the nest and the local tawny owl came and ate them all, killed them all. <laughs> but, you know, and the idea that tawny owls predate sparrowhawks was like, really? You know, they are badass. They, they do that. I saw one in the garden once during the day flying and it looked enormous it looked like i mean they aren't as big as a buzzard but it sort of looked almost as big as that you know i wouldn't mess with them but we we have them here and and i love them you know i love living in a place that's got tawny owls yeah 
I let the dog out too in the morning the other night because she woke up, but she does and needs to go out for a wee. Um, about the time I need to get up for a wee, but anyway. Um, and um, and uh, we opened the back door and there was the duet, as you say, the male to it, sorry, the female to it and the male to woo, as Shakespeare called it, you know. I think Shakespeare probably knew it was two birds, but I like to think that. Yeah, I mean, I've heard hooting during the day as well, actually, um, even in my West London um, patch of Wormer Scrubs, I remember hearing an owl hoot something and thinking, wow, and I wasn't quite sure why. I thought it might be the young bird just practising its... Uh, yeah, it could be. I've, I've heard them in spring as well, which would probably in May, June, when it might be a young male, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they're normally like the one over my shoulder, which was taken actually in Stuttgart in Germany, but I've seen, I remember being in a cemetery in um, Hungary, I think, I can't remember where, and seeing a wonderful grey-faced bird. It was being mobbed by a blackbird. In fact, thank you, blackbird, for pointing it out to me. Beautiful um, bird. Do you ever get grey-faced ones here? Is it always black? Yeah, I, um, funny enough, I think about that. A few years ago, I lived in Hampton in West London, which was about 20 years ago, and there was a car park in Bushy Park, which is where I used to go birding when I was a kid. And it was quite well known. And I went several times and there were two tawny owls roosting there, one brown and one grey, next to each other, literally in the same um, sort of bowl of the tree, you know, not really a hole, sort of a, a setback. Um, and it was, yeah, people were coming, we were showing people, it was amazing. You know, a friend of mine's mum came along and I showed her, you know, it was lovely to be able to show people them. Um, the last one I saw, the last tawny owl I think I saw, was about two years ago. We were walking up Hodder's Coombe in the Quantocks with a group of birders uh, we were showing round. And all the young, uh, middle of the afternoon in spring, and all the little woodland birds were going mad. And it took me about a minute to realise. I mean, it's so stupid, you know. I was like, duh, of course it's a tawny owl. It must be a tawny owl. And we then found it, you know, and there it was. And they were tweeting away around it, you know. And, Birds don't do that unless there's a reason. But... Yeah, and I think that's a really good uh, message to put out to any wannabe owl spotter. If you are walking in a parkland or wood and you hear birds go mental, uh, follow them because they could actually be pointing out a an owl. If you're the blackbird, when they do that, you know, that alarm call blackbirds give, That's yeah. I mean, they do that a lot anyway. But if you hear that, it's normally an owl. Yeah, I remember reading, again, I think in British Birds about... Um, tawny owls and the fact that you know we assume that they are hunters of rodents and small birds but they are also partial to a bit of carrion now and again yeah and fish they catch fish the guy filmed them didn't he in yorkshire for um one of the i think the natural world series and it was a owl catching fish you know it's a there's also a lovely story in the book well not a lovely story it's a pretty horrible story actually of a gamekeeper <laughs> back in the 20s wondering what was taking his baby pheasants because he basically shot every predator every sparrowhawk every buzzard in the area and he sat very quietly one day and this owl came in swooped down grabbed a pheasant so of course he shot the owl and the pheasant was still alive the owl had a tiny little baby pheasant the owl had basically put it in its claw but hadn't actually killed it because it was going to take it back to its nest presumably um, and he released it, none the worse for wear, as he put it. <laughs> but uh... Yeah, yeah, very nice. Um, now, tawny owls don't like long-eared owls. No. That's what my, that's what my, uh, my brother in Serbia tells me, my Milan, Milan yeah. is the uh, president of the Serbian bird life, but also a major owl expert. Long-eared owls are an interesting species for me because um, in the UK, I've probably seen long-eared owls maybe six times in my entire life. Yeah. The first time I remember driving to Norfolk as a younger man, actually I was being driven, my mate was driving, and an owl flew across the road, it was, it was dawn, or maybe it was dusk, I can't remember, it was half light anyway, it landed on the post and we stopped the car and there was this long-eared owl with his, with his ear tufts, and wow, amazing. And then I remember, or maybe I've done a few, you were probably in London at the time, but there was a, a roost discovered in Hillingdon, which is in West London. And I think there were 19 birds or something. Wow, was... I don't remember. I remember going to see the one at Dagenham Chase. 
Oh, yeah, we saw that too, yeah. There were five or six birds there. Well, I, funny enough, you should say that because you said you haven't seen them very often. I start the book by saying my first line is any encounter with an owl at any time of day or night is always unforgettable because you don't see them. I, I'd seen tawny, I'd seen long-eared owls at roosts probably three or four times in Britain and once in the Netherlands. I've not been to Serbia to see them. I'm still waiting for the invite. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you're watching Milan, I'd love to come. Anyway, um, about three years ago, I'm walking uh, around an area of grass near the River Parrot and the River Huntsville, where I go. It's my local patch, basically. But it's August, and I'm not looking for birds. I'm looking for butterflies. I've got my head down looking at brown argus, and I hear the swallows go mad, and a peregrine flies out. Quite unusual in August, but anyway, it flies out. All the swallows go mad, it flies off. So I'm carrying on looking for these butterflies. Lovely hot day. And suddenly I hear this rustle, and I look up for this hawthorn bush, and this owl flies out. And my brain does that thing that it does, you know, when you see a bird, and you're not sure what it is. So it went, obviously not barn, obviously not little, doesn't look like a short eared, therefore must be a tornia. That's my brain is going, must be tornia. And every, everything in my brain is going, it's really small and it's really orange and sort of rich colour. And it flew around and the swallows had a go at it. What threw me was it didn't have its ear tufts up because I knew this. i would never seen one in flight. I knew that when they fly, they lower their ear tufts. So as it flew around, my brain suddenly went, oh, my God, of course, it's long eared. First and only I've ever seen in Somerset. And probably the only one I've ever seen in Britain, not at a roost. Wow. So, yeah, beautiful. I mean, stunning bird. I... Well, you definitely need to come to Serbia. I'm actually going there this week to lead a tour and the long eight hour numbers there are phenomenal. You can spend four days walking around uh, in the town streets and parks and see upwards of 400 birds without without any problem. Well, I've written about it in the book, of course. You very kindly let me quote you. Yeah. <laughs> well, <coughs> excuse me. I mean, it's amazing, but you're right. I mean, every time you do see an owl, it is memorable. I remember being in Helsinki um, during the day, and it was June, um, and I remember because Helsinki um, in Finland, there's lots of islands everywhere, and you can. I hired a bike, or I didn't hire, I just took a bike from the hotel and rode this bike into an area of woodland on an island. And I remember start, standing on my bike, just standing still looking around me, and a red squirrel ran up to me to look at me, then ran off again. <laughs> And at the same time, a great tick came down from the branches. I felt like Dr. Doolittle. A, a great tick came down, landed on my cap, and then jumped back onto the bush again. And whilst watching that, I, was, I realized I was, uh, I was in a sort of a, a, an opening of the woodland, so it's a little clearing. And I saw something caught in my eye. I looked, and there was a long eared owl flying around hunting. It didn't even notice me. And I thought, I felt so privileged because. Usually they know it's you before you see them, if at all. Um, but this bird flew around, it landed in a tree and just sat there and it preened for a bit and just sat there. And I felt I need to sit here until he moves. I can't move. I, I can't reveal my, myself here. But it was one of the most magical moments I've ever had of an owl. I was there for about an hour, just me and the owl. The owl didn't see me at all. And it was, it was amazing. Well, we don't, it's like this encounter I had, you know, you, it's the unexpected, isn't it, with birds? It's nice to be shown birds, but if you can actually find them when you're not even looking for them, I think that's one of the joys, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not but sure we have to convert your audience to birds, but, you know, there may be people starting off, which is great, you know, but that's probably the joy of birding, isn't it? It's yeah, the absolutely. unexpected. For me, of the British owls, it's a long-eared owl I know the best, even though I barely see them in the UK, because obviously when I'm in Serbia, you see so many aspects of their behaviour in the open, you know, in an urban area. You look at them and they're all different shapes. Some are very elongated with their heads up, others are looking fat. You know, I saw one with a red eye and a yellow eye, I called it Bowie. You know, <laughs> yeah. so, there's so many different characters um, in that one species that you just never would ever imagine because you just don't see them, you know, incredible birds. No, absolutely. So I guess from the long-eared owl, we can move to the short-eared owl. Mm. Uh, I, put them, I put them in the same chapter in the book, 
not because they're similar, because they're, as you know, they are almost the opposite end of owls, but because they are called shorted and long-eared, we tend to lump them together, don't we? Mm. Short-eared owl also, if you if you now consider the barn owl to be three species, the short-eared owl is now the most um, widespread owl in the world. I didn't know this until I, I learned a lot when I researched these books. Um, you know, they're found on the Galapagos, where they are hunted by Galapagos hawks. But on some islands, there are no hawks, so they hunt by day. In other islands, where their hawks only hunt by night, things like that. You know, they're incredibly common in the United States. Um and they're and they also great travellers, short-eared owls, whereas long-eared and, and particularly tawny are very sedentary. Um, you know, they're they're great sort of global travellers, really. And I, you know, they're lovely birds. I love short-eared owl. Yeah, I mean, again, when I think of short-eared owl in the UK, I'm thinking of some area of marshland, probably in east eastern England, like in Essex or Kent or north, you know, north East Anglia. Isle of Shepherd is a very good place. Isle of Shepherd, yeah, in Kent. I used to see a lot more. When I was a kid, I used to see them a lot more. I think they've declined a lot. I think fewer come in winter here because it's warmer weather further north and east. Um, very rare in Somerset. I've seen about half a dozen, probably. It took me quite a long time to see one at all. Mm. Um, the best one in Somerset may have been my first. I think it was about 10 years ago, George, my son, who was about six, and I went for a walk on Christmas Eve snowed it would have been 2011 so he would have been six 2010 2011 and we went down with my brother-in-law and his dog and we walked round the back of our house and we did we only saw one bird and it was a short-eared owl it was in the hedgerow and it flew off and it looked amazing against the snow and then it landed on the other side of the field and just stared at us with these bright yellow eyes you know just incredible and it was literally the only bird we saw on a sort of 40 minute walk, you know, because yeah. it was so cold. But yeah, beautiful bird. Well, interestingly, I get them every year um, at the Worm and Scrubs in West London, surrounded by urbanity. Normally, a bird just flying, I mean, you've got to be in it to win it. It doesn't show up on given days. You have to be sort of looking for them every, every day. But flying, you know, across the scrubs, one time, one bird stayed for, I think, at least a day, um, hunting over the sh tiny grassland we have there, which I found incredible because A, it's in the middle of urbanity, B, it's ridden with dog walkers, you yeah. know, and plus C, a million crows, are, you know, go after every time it pitched up. So it was, how it stayed there was just, for me, incredible. They're lovely birds. So one was reported from my patch yesterday, actually, which is, I have seen them there, but it's always annoying when other people report things from your patch. But they said it was absolutely bucketing down with rain and it was looking very miserable. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the, the other memorable moment I've had with short eared owl, apart from again in Serbia, where they sometimes roost with long eared owls, which is like a, a new, new, unusual piece of behavior, um, was being in, um, I think I was in Latvia. Um, by the Baltic Sea, and then all of a sudden, one flew in, uh, flew in off the sea, being chased by a, a, a Caspian gull. Um, and that was quite an unusual sight, to see a gull chasing a, a short-eared owl. Yeah, I saw one coming off the sea at Clyde once, probably having it looked like it had flown over the North Sea. Dave's put something in um, the chat box saying he was watching three short-eared owls over Staines Moor. That was Staines Reservoirs, used to be my local patch. Um and there were reports of 13 birds there. I mean, that's a great sight, Staines Moor. I never really went there as a kid. I think it wasn't very good then for birds, or maybe I just didn't know about it. But it's had some fantastic birds since. But, yeah, I think I think short-eared owls are a bird that will turn up in urban or semi-urban or suburban areas. Again, maybe we see them more because, of course, they are mainly day-flying, aren't they? You know, they're... they're I mean, they're really, I think ecologically, they always remind me of a harrier, hen harrier, you know, they similar breeding area and similar. You see a, a female hen harrier coming towards you or shorted out, fairly similar structure and flight. And when I see shorted owls up in the air, I sometimes see them way up. I always think, what well, that's a weird looking harrier or something. And then you think, oh, of course, it's a shorted owl, you know, but they're not. They, they don't immediately strike you as being owls, do they? No, they've got a very curious kind of rowing flight. They've, they've, yeah. They've, yeah. And, you know, once you see that, or once you get used to that flight pattern, you kind of can recognise them anyway. 
But in Serbia, it's interesting because when they um, one or two roosts with the long eared owls, and they're much more skittish than the long eared owls. So if you approach a tree by accident, the short eared owl will fly for miles. It just fly off, and they're bigger than the long eared owls. Yeah, quite a bit bigger, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. But uh, with the long eared owls, they they will fly off, but then they come back. Whereas the long eared owl, the short eared owl, just just go away for a long while. But the other thing is that the um, the short-eared owl at, at dusk, when the other owls are beginning to arouse, um, the long-eared owls, they fly in the towns and stuff. They fly on top of a tree, on top of a church, almost as if they're just stretching their wings, getting ready to go out into the countryside to hunt. Whereas the short-eared owl will just spiral up like a lasso, high into the night sky, ever, in, ever increasing circles, and then kind of lasso off into the countryside so they've got a very different pattern you can recognize them even without seeing any detail of plumage you can just recognize their behavior it's yeah. fascinating absolutely fascinating all right well from short eared owl and long eared owl let's let's shift over to our little friend the little owl now that's got an interesting story hasn't it yeah little owls are funny they're probably the only introduced non-native species in britain that has been generally, not exclusive, but generally welcomed here. And I think partly because, of course, they're the only, apart from if you count red leg partridge, they're the only European non-native species in Britain. They they would have been, a, they were a vagrant in Britain um, and they would have probably bred here hundreds of years ago, but they were brought over in the 1800s by rich landowners like Charles Waterton or Lord Lilford, who wanted They'd heard that these birds, which they do, they eat sort of insect pests, so they sort of introduce them in their, into their vegetable gardens. <laughs> and, you know, little owls, they spread pretty quickly. They, from the 1890s, I think it was 80s, you know, by 1920, they were over most of southern Britain. The place they called, caused problems was, Scott, I think it was Scotcolm Island, where Ronald Lockley, the great seabird man, was. Because they, he'd found a, a, a little owl's nest and they looked inside it and it had about 200 corpses of storm petrels in. So he made the difficult decision to shoot the owls because he said, we've, we've got to, because they're eating, literally eating all the storm petrels. Um, but apart from that, generally, they're a pretty benevolent bird. They're, they're very characterful, aren't they? I mean, all owls are, but really, probably little owls, the cheeky one. When I moved down here again, I thought I'd see them everywhere in Somerset. Didn't see any. Kept looking on barn roofs, you know, posts, whatever. And one day, Mick, who's our neighbour who has an allotment over the road, um, he called me over. He said, oh, come and have a look at this. And there in his hedgerow, on a bright summer's day, two yellow eyes staring back at me. And it was the little owl. And it was so nice. So I've had them in the garden. And I tell the story in the book that about two years ago, uh, my son Charlie always um, sleeps with his windows wide open, particularly in summer. And we had little owls breeding in the orchard next door, and they were coming up onto the buildings and going. They, I love their call. I didn't really hear it till I moved down here. It's, it always sounds like a lapwing being squeezed to me. It goes, nee, nee, nee. and he said, "This bloody owl is doing this all night and keeping me awake. I'm going to get an air rifle and shoot it." And I said, "Well, they." Charlie, yeah, A, that's not very nice. B, you might damage my reputation slightly if you if you shoot a little owl. So please don't. And he said, all right. And he finally got used to them. But, you know, I love seeing them on the roof. I love hearing them at night, you know. Um, they're not as regular as tawnies. We get tawnies every, all the time or every year. Little owl, they'll go away and then they'll come back. But great birds. Yeah, I mean, again, another uh, underestimated bird in terms of their distribution, because, for example, in London, the place to go for a long time was to go to, to was, it, was it the Peter Pan statue in um, in Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens? And there was, really? uh, there was always a little owl hanging around on the trees near there. Um, but I think some research was subsequently done, and it, the conclusion was that there could be upwards of sixty pairs of long-eared owl, sorry, little owls in the, in the London area. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, believe that. I think there's at least that, and probably same with tawnies. You know, I mean, the, even though they are more diurnal than tawny owls, they still hide very well, don't they? They don't they don't show themselves very often. Um, 
and they're just you know they're very attractive little birds and i think you know they've they've sort of proved themselves again they're declining now because of farming you know like barn owls everything is in trouble because uh, you know we're, we're, we just haven't got as much food for birds like that and little owls are pretty you know unfussy about their diet they'll eat all sorts of things but there's less food generally yeah and i guess most people don't realize that they are actually the same genus as the the cute burrowing owl in uh, in the us and and south america they're very cute burrowing owls you were going to ask me what my favorite owl was weren't you burrowing owls will be quite high on the list yeah i filmed them with bill in florida a few about 20 years ago they were brilliant they're like long-legged little owls aren't they yeah yeah they pop up like meerkats don't they you <laughs> suddenly see his head going up <laughs> oh they're yeah. great and of course where i am in spain um they are a fairly regular very regular occurrence actually you have very to good. scan yeah, you've got to scan the dry stone walls or piles of rocks and you t normally might see one just disguised as a rock so they're quite common so um i guess we've we've kind of rattled through four of the uk sales but there is a fifth. tawny barn little long ear shorted as all of them oh yeah. Oh, oh, that case. There's two others. There's two others in the book. Snowy Owl. Yeah, which I saw on Fettler back in 1982. Now, tell me about Snowy Owls, because that's a bird, but I've wanted, there's, there's only three birds on this planet I vowed never to twitch. Uh, so, um, the um, red flank blue tail, which I've yet to see. I've never seen one. Uh, Sabine's Gull. I found one in Chile of all places, and it turned out to be the most southerly of uh, record in Chile ever, and the snowy owl. I've only ever seen one snowy owl once, and it was in Shetland last year. Oh, did you? How lovely. Yeah, I, I've only seen one once. It was, as I say, 41 years ago on Fetler. It was one of the females that had stayed on after the male died. Uh, well, I think the male died. Um, great story, because for a while in the late 60s, the snowy owl was probably the most famous British bird. And the man who found them nesting on Fetler, Bobby Tullet, was probably Britain's fam most famous birder, because it, it was all over the newspapers at the time. Um, you're far too young to remember. as of course. But, um, you know, it was a period of, strangely, of localised regional climatic cooling. And what happened was that in the Northern Hemisphere from the 1940s onwards till about the late mid 70s, we had much colder weather than expected. And this particularly affected Northwestern Europe and Scandinavia. And a whole load of species turned up in Britain, like wood sandpiper, green sandpiper, red wing field fair, and started breeding here in very small numbers. Golden, of course, which stayed. And the snowy owl was the most famous and the most sort of exciting of those because it 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 bred on Shetland in 1967 and it became a sort of media star before social media existed. Um, I suppose they yeah they just are incredibly charismatic birds. Yeah, I mean, I I feel insanely jealous of the people living in North America, especially during snowy owl years. I mean. Seeing the pictures of snowy owls sat on top of buildings in Detroit or getting as yeah. far as Manhattan or even yeah. further south in the Bahamas and places like that. And it's like Hawaii. I, see... I mean, yeah, they're incredible birds. And they, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, because I speak to my American friends who tell me, oh, yeah, we see snowy owls all the time. And I'm thinking, oh, I've only ever seen one. You know? yeah. I mean, they come to Britain. They were on one was on Scilly a few years ago, wasn't it? You know, and, she, and obviously the Hebrides and Kilda this year, I think. Um, they're a sort of bird. I'd love to be walking up Ben McDewey in the in, in the Highlands on the, you know, the, the extremely unlikely chance of me actually going for a long walk in the Scottish Highlands. But if I ever did, and I'd love to just stumble across a snowy owl because they're probably there every winter, but people just don't see them you know they they look like rocks of this sort of whitish with gray flecks on them and black flecks you know yeah so, yeah so great birds. what is the other species then eagle owl now that's a very contentious species it because is. some people right. say some people say no some people say yes yeah it's well but, uh, the, all thing, the yeah. official all the official bodies are sitting on the fence with eagle owls because what's happened eagle owls are very common in captivity they have 
almost certainly either been released or escaped, deliberately released or, or accidentally escaped. And they've started breeding in parts of Britain, Yorkshire, Lancashire, mostly. Um, not many. We don't really know how many, but a few pairs. Uh, then there's big controversy. Are they, are they really a British bird? Well, they probably were here. There's, there's prehistoric, you know, um, evidence of bones back in Devon, I think, I can't remember when it was, a few thousand years ago, you know, but certainly in recent times, they haven't been here. They're pretty common, obviously, on the continent. Um, they are, if you think the tawny owl and the ural owl are big, tough predators, obviously the eagle owl is the the, the capo de capo, isn't he? Because they're the ones that, you know, hunt buzzards and goshawks and hen harriers and things. You know, these are seriously hard birds. Um, I've seen a few over the years. I've seen a few in Europe and Israel. I've seen... Um, the pharaoh eagle owl in Israel, which is a much smaller, paler bird. I've seen different species in Africa, giant eagle owl, things like that. Um, they're always pretty damn impressive. So I'd quite like them in Britain. I quite, I think it's quite a good thing that they're here. But yeah, I think a lot of people will be arguing with you. I mean, I, I was told that the best, the 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 place with the biggest density of uh, eagle owls is a city which I hadn't even heard of before, um, but it is a famous city in its own right for other reasons. Um, Wuppertal, Wuppertal in Germany. Uh, oh, yeah. apparently, apparently there were a whole stack of eagle owls nesting there. And I went to a site by a petrol station in the city, um, which had a kind of a cliff behind it to try and see one. But of course I didn't see any, um, but they apparently exclusively hunt rats. There's lots of rats for, for them to eat there. So that's what they do. But, you know, they're such a large bird. They are quite hard to find. I mean, again, yeah. they're next to Maduna. I, I guess they're fairly common, <coughs> but I've only come across three nests ever in my life here. And I've only ever found one by chance ever. Yeah. Well, they're great pest controllers, aren't they, as you say? But yeah, pretty, pretty impressive bird, though, to be fair. Yeah. I, I think owls are really interesting. And the fact that, you know, they, I suppose in in literature they've always kind of been portrayed as sort of hooting um yes yeah. but there is one species which i when i heard call and i never i've not i've never actually heard them call in real life i've heard people use their call to attract american vagrants out of the bushes and it's the eastern screech owl yeah. which to me sounds like a, a little pony Yeah. Like we 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 did it in Florida with Bill, and we got everything down, and we got Eastern Screech Owl. And I've in Costa Rica, I've seen guides use ferruginous pig yeah. down, and the owls come out as well. So we get the little birds, and then the owl goes, "Yeah, all right, what's happening?" You know. Well, that happened because obviously I was with not obviously, but you won't know this, guys. But I was with Stephen. I had the pleasure of be hanging out with Stephen in Ecuador um, a few weeks ago. But I wasn't with you on this particular walk, um, but he, the, the guide played um, uh, the, what's the, uh, uh, pygmy owl, the European pygmy owl, how really? to play it, and a um, Andean pygmy owl suddenly answered. Wow. And there it was, we saw it, you know, so it's quite interesting um, by using these calls, you can bring out owls out, and of course, when you go to these places like in South America and Asia, there's this whole thing about owling now, isn't it? It's become a bit of a thing now, isn't it? Yes. It's people's yeah. tours, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they take you out. We went out, didn't we, one evening um, for a couple of hours looking for two species of owl and didn't get either, did we? <laughs> it's the only disappointing thing in Ecuador, actually. It was like, right, let's go home now because we're bored and we haven't seen anything. But, um, yeah, I mean, I love... You know, I've seen uh, at the last chapter of the book, I write about I've seen about 40 species of owls around the world. There's I think there's 260 or something. So got a few to go. Um, and I write about those again because all the encounters are memorable. I write about filming the burrowing owls with Bill. I write about seeing Pell's fishing owl in Botswana. It was an amazing experience, um, you know, and, uh, you know, owls are amazing. They range from, you know, the elf owl, which is even smaller than the Eurasian pygmy owl. So sparrow size, if that, up to Blakiston's, I don't know how to pronounce it, Blakiston's or Blakiston's fish owl, which is bigger than an eagle owl. 
is is thought to be the largest owl in the world. Obviously, they vary in size a bit, but um, you know, so they're quite a varied family as well. Um, I think we tend to because owl is such an image, we tend to think, oh, they're quite similar. But as we've said already, just with the British ones, they lead very different kinds of lives. They do indeed. Um, your book, Owl, is it actually out now? It is. It came out in October. It's available from all good independent bookshops, which I um, independent bookshops like my books because they sell them at Christmas, which is lovely. Um, very cheap Christmas present, fourteen ninety nine. You'll probably get a discount. Um, I think it's doing well. I think interestingly, the Robin sold about fifty thousand copies so far, and it's still selling. The Wren about twenty five thousand, and the Swallow and Swan, although they did very well compared to most nature books they sold six seven thousand each it was a bit of a disappointment but my publishers are very confident that owl will will come you know will be a bestseller because people love them yeah exactly i think exactly. more than they do i think they're right because the, the reason i did this book i went for a meeting with my lovely publishers penguin and, and I've two young women now work there editors and her assistant and they're really good and they said we've done some research and i said oh right fine because we haven't decided which bird i'd do and they said We've done Google Analytics. So I was like, OK, I can probably work out what that is. And what I believe it is, is how many hit, hits is each species getting on Google, you know, when people do a search. And Al was like way out ahead, miles higher than anything else. And they said that. And I went, you know what? I could do a book on the Al if you let me do all of them. Because I thought, I, I don't think I'd have enough material for one species. Um, and they were very happy. So I'm writing, I'm now writing the second book in, well, the sixth in the series, the second on that deal. But I can't tell you what it is because I'll have to shoot you. But it'll be out next week. No, it's out next October. Got till February to write it. I've written most of it. Okay, well, we'll have this way. It's a very famous bird in Somerset. Oh, okay. I think I know what it is. Well, There's the thing is, huh? There's a lot of them here. Oh, uh, Flacco the eagle owl. Thank you for putting that in. Thank you. We, uh, Dennis, yeah, we have an eagle owl living in New York City. Marianne, my editor, goes to New York. I think she's got friends or family there. And she came back and said, have you got Flacco in your book? I was writing the book at the time. And I said, what's Flacco? And, you know, you know that it's this fantastic eagle owl that escaped from the zoo and they cannot capture it. There's also a great horned owl nearby, a female, I think, either elsewhere in Central Park or close by, which, of course, is a wild bird that has turned up there. So, yeah, Flacco the Eagle Owl stars in the book. So, um, so well, thank I, you. Hope, I hope that Flacco doesn't start breeding because that's not, not a good thing. No, I don't think it will. I think, I, think, I think there's only one of it. And, yeah, the Google searches are thanks to Harry Potter, Dave. Yeah, and, and obviously Hedwig the Owl features in the book mainly because in the films they had to use a male snowy owl because male snowy owls are about that big and females are about that big and they were worried that Daniel Radcliffe would get his, you know, arms ripped off by a female, so they went for a male. Okay. Uh, Franz well, asked, why isn't it a good... Yeah, we'll, we'll do the Q&A yeah. in a minute, Stephen. When, when, yeah, I know. Steve, I know. When, we I end, when we end this bit. But I need to ask you a question, actually, and that is, if you had to choose one owl, one type yeah. of animal species owl, what would it be? As your so favorite. hard, so hard, isn't it? I think if I could choose a bird I haven't seen, but I'm hoping to see because I'm going to Japan to see my son early next year, and I might go again. I'd love to see Blackiston's fish owl. Probably the most memorable owl I've ever seen was the Pell's fishing owl in Botswana. I mean, extraordinary looking bird, looks like a monkey, very weird looking thing. Oh. Um, I never thought I'd see one. They're so rare. I think I'd been to parts of Africa where they said, oh, you might see a Pell's fishing owl, but you have to stay up till four in the morning and then you've only got a one in 10 chance. And I'm like, oh, give that a miss. But they took me during the day um, in the Delta. The local guys took me um, and we found this owl. It was just stunning. So I think Pell's fishing owl would be pretty high on the list. Yeah, I've yet to see one. Um just to let you know, Zoomers and anyone else watching, um, that there's a few more interesting people coming up. Um, tomorrow, for example, we have Marilyn Simmons, who's a Canadian, an awarded Canadian writer. And she's written a book about a lady called Louise, the Carolyn Lawrence, who I've never heard of, to be honest. But she actually was an extraordinary recluse 
who lived in Canada, who came from, I think, Germany or someplace like that. And she, through her study, changed the way we see birds, all of us actually. Um, and we've got people like uh, Jeff Knott from the RSPB, and he'll be talking about what is the Royal Society for Protection of Birds. And, and, and the, another guy called Darren Nash, who is going to be talking about cryptozoology, a subject that if I wasn't interested in birds, that would be the one I'd be going for, a fascinating subject. Um, but Stephen, anyway, I know you're a busy man. You've probably got a lot of writing to do when, when, we, when we cut this call now. But um, thank you very much for your time tonight. Um, I wish you every success with the book. Um, it's a great book. Get out there and get it. Um, but thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dave. It's been a pleasure, as always, to chat to you. Yeah, and I look forward to seeing you again next year for the new book. Absolutely. Um, and Zoomers, what can I say? Always there, always supporting uh, in conservation with. Totally respect that. Um, so we're going to do a Q&A in a minute for those who aren't uh, members of the uh, Urban Bird World community. Well, you may have to miss out on that one. But if you are a member, then you can see all of the uh, Q and A's for all 160 people who've been speaking to uh, up until now. But um, and can I just say, Jess is here and Jess has helped me with the new book. So she knows exactly what the next book is. <laughs> She's not going to tell anyone. Okay, we might have to grill her in the Q and A. But anyway, until we meet again, guys, hope to see you soon. Keep looking up.